So welcome to uh, this uh, joint uh, MIT uh, Harvard course on, uh, and in some sense also joint Princeton course uh, on uh, proofs, beliefs, and algorithm through the lens of sum of squares. And Pablo and I will be giving uh, the lecture, uh, the lectures here. And probably Pablo is teaching another course, so probably uh, I will. Uh, the split will not be exactly 50-50. And because he's already used so much to teaching, he can teach all of the courses, the lectures here. <laughs> the, 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 marginal, the marginal cost for him is like less. So, um, and, um, and we share a website, but at Princeton, I mean, at Princeton they will uh, pro progress in their own uh, schedule. And, and this, this is uh, the website. Uh, if you haven't yet uh, for the course, and we also David and I are also writing some lecture notes uh, that maybe eventually will turn into some monograph or something like that, and uh, and and these lecture notes are available on this <laughs> sumofsquares.org. And okay, um, so before we start, you know, talking about actual uh, math, let me just do uh, talk a little bit about some administrative issues. So first of all, uh, so these are um, the instructors are me and Pablo. This is the website. The first thing you have to do is join Piazza if you haven't done so already. If uh, the way Piazza is set up to, for you to sign up, for, uh, you can sign up without a Harvard email address. So if you don't have a Harvard email address, fill out that Google form, and then I'll, I, um, I go over there like uh, once every couple of days and other people that sign up in the, the form. So the times, uh, this, is, uh, this course is on Fridays, 10 a.m. till 1 p.m., and it will rotate between Harvard and MIT. The rotation will generally be one week here, one week there, but uh, because of various constraints, uh, uh, it might not always be exactly like that. So there is a Google Calendar um, on the website with exactly the location, in particular, Apparently, uh, MIT is its own different country and has its MIT holidays that I never heard about uh, before. So, uh, and, and, and I guess we have to observe the MIT holidays as well. I'm still not sure exactly how you celebrate them, but uh, apparently one, one way you celebrate them is you don't have classes. So we will uh, probably want to do some makeup lectures. Uh, probably, to me, like one reasonable time that seems not to conflict uh, with other things would be maybe if we can't do a lecture on a Friday, do it maybe on, a, on the first day before that 4 to 7 p.m. or something like that, that kind of would not conflict. But we, I'll run kind of a poll uh, to, to find times for these, uh, for these things. And, um, okay, and what you need to do um, if you want to take this course uh, for credit, first of all, I'll, I'm happy to have you show up regardless of whether you take it for credit or not. Um, I'm also very happy uh, you know, to uh, have you uh, sign up to take it for credit. It would be nice if the, you know, the first joint MIT Harvard uh, theory course will not have like zero people involved in it. And uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, it's a graduate class. The truth is I don't really care about uh, what grade, uh, uh, like, about grades here, uh, it's more about what you put in, uh, what you put in it into this class is what you'll get out of it. So basically, what you uh, what you need to do is you know show up, you know read what I email in Piazza to read before each lecture, and the exercises will not have we don't have TAs and will not have submissions exercises, but I would expect you to try to solve them on your own or with friends. You know, it doesn't have to be typed up, etc. because you're not submitting them. You can uh, just get, uh, you know, a bunch of friends over some uh, snacks or drinks and, and go next to a whiteboard and try to solve uh, or on a napkin and try to solve the exercises together. And please do participate in class and uh, in Piazza. I hope that uh, because you, you guys will be reading the lecture notes, before each lecture, we can have the lectures a little bit more of a discussion rather than just me, um, you know, talking at you. And uh, and you can also discuss uh, you can also discuss the homework and exercises uh, in the piazza. Don't don't hesitate to do that. 
use just the same mechanism as you do when you do discuss, discuss a movie. If you're going to post about your solution, uh, just put spoiler alert. So if someone didn't yet do it and doesn't want to, uh, it, the exercise to be ruined from them, they know not to read. So if you note that uh, basically um, uh, most of these things, like uh, reading and doing the exercises, I can't really verify that you did it. And like I said, it's a grad course. I don't really care. It's, you'll get out of it what you put into it. I trust you that uh, you know, um, if you take this course, and then um, you know, you'll follow along. So, so it will be more beneficial for you. But um, yeah, so we're not going to have a lot of formal requirements. Um, it's more about learning, and, um, and I hope that we'll all enjoy it. Okay, any questions about administrative stuff? Okay. So, um, okay, so let's start with the uh, course. Um, so, okay. So, what are the two most beautiful uh, words in, in the English language? So, of course, there are free cookies, but apart from those two words, <laughs> Um, the two most beautiful words uh, are like what, what was exactly your first guess. You know, every, every, you know, if you ask a person on the, on the street, they would tell you that the two most beautiful words in the English language are, of course, linear and convex. <laughs> <laughs> At least on the street here. <laughs> so, so this is, of course, b beautiful. When, when, when we have problems that are linear and convex, we can solve them, we are happy, and, uh, and, and, and that's what we like. But unfortunately, um, you know, the world is a cruel place, and um, and uh, we're like we have these um, roaming, these uh, ugly creatures of you know non-convex and non-linear problems. And uh, in particular, almost every time we want to solve something in life, we actually encounter uh, non-convexity and non-linearity. So you know, in optimization, we have these discrete problems. Um, you know, we are trying to find an actual uh, assignment. We, you know, we put, want to put something uh, in the knapsack. We are not, can often not break it in, like, you know, in some part and put some part here and some part there. Um, in learning, in machine learning, often the objectives are non-convex, like, for example, in, in uh, trying to learn neural networks. Um, in control, I don't know much about it. Pablo is the expert, but I think that basically everything is nonlinear. Uh, we only have linear approximations, and they are not always so great. Um, so, so we have to deal with this nonlinearity and non-convexity, uh, and and we generally uh, cannot do so. so. We generally have, we believe that these problems, you know, um, they are NP hard, they are computationally hard. So, so we can't do it in general, and what we typically do it, we have various algorithms that we tailor to try to solve the particular problem at hand. So in theoretical computer science, for every different uh, discrete problem, um, there is, uh, you know, whether it's max cut or uh, bisection or, um, or uh, sparse cut or uh, uh, whatever, um, also problems that don't involve graph and just escape me at the moment, uh, that um, for every kind of discrete problem, we have you know, a, a paper saying, uh, here is this problem, here is the algorithm I give for it, and it gives these guarantees. Maybe it's an approximation algorithm if the problem is NP-hard, and maybe you know, I improved uh, and the factor by something. And, um, in uh, practice, people use various heuristics. So, you know, they have this uh, problem. They run a SAT solver. That SAT solver doesn't work. They try another SAT solver. They try to massage the problem. Uh, you know, in learning, they use, uh, you know, this kind of gradient descent and that kind of gradient descent. And uh, so basically, um, we try to, um, you know, because we can't solve the problems in generality, we kind of try to, for every different uh, instance, try to do. Um, the best we can uh, for that particular instance. And our focus on this uh, course is uh, on a di somewhat different approach, which is kind of trying to do a general framework that uh, can be applied to basically um, every, any problem. And this is this uh, sum of squares semi-definite program that uh, Pablo is one of the originators of. 
And uh, the advantage for that is, first of all, it's really apply, can apply, uh, applicable essentially to any problem. You, you, there are some sometimes it's not always canonical how you phrase the problem in the form that you can run the sum of squares, um, semi-definite program on it, but we'll get to that. And um, because it's, apply, it's applicable to any problem, and some of these problems are computationally hard, it will not always work. And um, to be more accurate, it will always work, but uh, it might take a lo very long time. So if you give it a finite uh, time budget, then it will not always succeed. But the interesting thing is that often, uh, within that budget, we don't know of any other algorithm that does significantly better. So often, even though it's a very general framework that apparently doesn't try to do all the uh, ad hoc tricks that people apply to particular problems, often it achieves the same results that you would achieve when you have a tailor-made algorithm. And a nice thing that I particularly like about this is that even when it doesn't work, even when it fails, you can look at the state of this uh, algorithm and uh, try to extract from it some kind of partial knowledge about the solution that it failed to recover. Any more questions? Any? Okay. So that's um, one, one sh answer that will be meaningless right now is this notion of pseudo distribution, but will um, uh, hopefully by the end of uh, you know by one p.m. it will not be meaningless. So let me give kind of an abbreviated history of this sum of squares. Uh, I guess you've all read the, the introduction uh, that I uh, posted online. So kind of know it, but it doesn't hurt to repeat it. So um, the, the, two tasks that are, the, the two tasks that are very, very related to one another. One is, you know, you're given some function f, you want to find uh, over some domain omega. You're trying to find the x that minimizes it. Either to compute the minimum value or uh, find the actual minimizer x. We are not going to distinguish so much between these two variants. And uh, the the second type of uh, problem is to show that, uh, to, to certify that the minimum is not too small, to give, uh, to give some bound uh, that the minimum is at least something. And these are kind of two uh, dual problems. Ideally, um, you know, if the actual minimum of f is alpha star, then you are able to do both things. You are able to find the x star that achieves alpha star and to certify that uh, it is actually the global minimum in the sense that uh, certify that fx is at least alpha star for every x. So those are kind of two general problems that we always want to solve. And around the turn of the 20th century, people uh, looked at uh, the uh, particular case where f is a polynomial and omega is just um, you know, uh, Rn. Uh, so it's an n-variate polynomial over the, over the reals. And Minkowski asked the question, I think around the 1890s, if you can always certify, for example, let's just assume that alpha is 0. Can you always certify that f x is uh, non-negative uh, by writing f as a sum of squares of other polynomials. And I think in his PhD thesis, uh, Hilbert shows that the answer is no. And in fact, he even gave kind of a characterization exactly how many variables and what degree uh, you can do it and when you can't do it. Uh, so generally, um, you can do it if the polynomial is at most quad quadratic or if it has at, le uh, at most uh, two variables. And in fact, uh, it took a long time. Uh, so Hilbert gave kind of a non-constructive counterexample uh, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, question. And uh, it took a long time for people to find a constructive counterexample. And this was by Motzkin, I guess, uh, like 70 years later. And um, this polynomial is always non-negative because of the arithmetic mean, ge geometric mean inequality. Um, you can see it easier if you divide by three, then the first three terms are the, are, um, if, you, if you look at the geometric mean of this, this, and this, you get this, right? Um, so, uh, so this polynomial is always no negative, but uh, it's not a sum of squares. However, um, Hilbert uh, asked, uh, this polynomial happens to be like a sum of uh, squares of uh, rational functions. and. Um, and Hilbert generally uh, uh, predicted that maybe, uh, maybe for every polynomial that is non-negative, you can write it as a sum of squares of rational functions. 
and he posed this as its uh, you know, 17th problem in his famous 1900 address where he listed his uh, list of uh, open problems. And this was resolved by Artin in 1927. He showed, yes, this is uh, the case. And, um, and later, uh, this was generalized to a much more general setting, more than just 1f and um, omega, not just the Rn, but the uh, arbitrary variety. And this is uh, known as the positive Stenel stats. Pablo, is this accurate uh, so far? OK. Wow, that's surprising. <laughs> I typically don't have an accurate slide in uh, <laughs> my talks. So, um, so, so this was kind of like the you know, uh, first half of the 20th century. But of course, in the second half, we started to have computers, and we started asking qu quantitative questions. So not just uh, whether something I in principle has a, a, you know, a certificate, but how simple or complicated is this certificate. And, and, and different people uh, approach this problem from uh, different angles. So on the proof side, uh, Vorobiev and Grigoriev uh, in 99, they, they suggested to measure the complexity of these of, uh, proofs of this form of, like say, sum of squares of rational functions or some more general things by the maximum degree that appears there. Um, and uh, Grigoriev showed that uh, this maximum degree can be linear in the number of variables for uh, problems like 3XO and NAPSAC. And we'll see that for these kind of Boolean uh, problems, this is actually the best. And, um, and uh, on the algorithm side, uh, even before them, uh, Naum show, uh, showed that uh, uh, gave an n to the O of the algorithm for finding degree D uh, proofs in some restricted setting. And this was extended to the much more general setting by uh, Pablo and uh, Lasser. And um, so basically, they show that when there is a degree D proof, you can find it in n to the D time. And these guys showed uh, that sometimes D can be large, so sometimes this can be exponential, but sometimes can, um, D can also be small. And the typical kind of question we ask is the following. So suppose this is the true, the true answer. The minimum is really alpha star. So we can ask, what's the, sim uh, the smallest D star so that we can certify with a degree D? Notice I know that I still didn't define what a degree D sum of squares proof is. And we'll get to that. But uh, we will define it, and then we'll give it this notation. Uh, so what is the smallest degree, like, like the simplest, uh, the shortest proof, if you can think of it, that certifies the true bound, that certifies that f is really um, larger, uh, larger than alpha star? So you can think of this star as basically me measuring the complexity of this statement. And another question could be that you're given a complexity budget. You're only allowed to use proofs of this length. What is the best bound you could do? So clearly, uh, so you might not be able to prove the actual uh, minimum. Maybe you'll only be able to show a bound on something much uh, like, you know, you'll only be able to show that um, f is at least minus a million. Or, you know, maybe f is really no negative, but, uh, you can, uh, but this requires a long proof. But to prove that f is at least minus million might require a short proof. So, so this is the kind of questions we ask. What's the, if we have a given complexity budget, what's the best statement we can prove? And, and generally speaking, when, typically when we, get, we can prove the optimal statement, we can also uh, get the actual minimizer. We, when we can't prove the optimal uh, statement, we typically also cannot get the actual minimizer. But we can ask the question, can, can we still get, uh, get partial information about this x star? And partial information could mean it's kind of a problem-dependent thing. Maybe we want to get something, some, something that is close to x star, or, uh, or maybe we want to get some string, that, uh, some, some uh, vector that might not be close to x star, but gives uh, a similar value, that, but, uh, that somehow gives a related value. Yes? Sorry, what is the symbol again? The double? This. Yeah, yes. Nice. So that symbol, we haven't yet formally defined it, but what it will mean is that you can cert prove this thing by a, a degree d sum of squares proof. So for now, even think of it that it means that uh, you know, f minus alpha to the d is like a sum of squares of degree d polynomials or rational functions, but later we'll kind of make it more, more formal. So yeah, but this is a good question because I'm using here uh, a question that, uh, you know, a, a symbol that I didn't define. And 
so basically, um, so this is kind of the high level uh, questions of, the, of this research. So, the, uh, and, and we are um, going to uh, move to the whiteboard soon and, and uh, do, you know, start doing actual math. But uh, any other questions at this point? Yes. Yes. What with the number of rational functions you need? Yes, that's uh, the the next uh, what uh, one of the first thing we'll do, um, um, or maybe one of the first thing you'll do because I think it will be actually an exercise is to show that uh, um, well we'll actually work with polynomials but modulo some ideal but uh, what we'll show is that you don't need if the degree is bounded you also don't need too many of those. So, but that that's something that needs to be proven. So. Um, So I guess we'll um, move to the whiteboard. So we can. Uh, how do you turn on the lights here? Ah, and this. Ah, this. And uh, maybe this. Ah, okay. Very good. So I should probably take my notes, so I know what I'm talking about. Okay. Ma? Ah, yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so now Okay, so so uh, for the first few lectures, I'm going to focus on um, a special case that makes things somewhat technically simpler, but it somehow still captures most of what we're uh, interested about. And this is basically minimizing a function, uh, minimizing a polynomial over uh, Boolean inputs. So we are going to look at, uh, so focus is going to be minimum of f of x, x, 0, 1 to the n. So this captures many uh, combinatorial problems. You can you know, present uh, problems like 3SAT, uh, uh, MaxCAT, um, um, and, and various other problems uh, you can present in this, uh, in this, uh, in this way. And, um, and now I'm going to uh, basically define, uh, define this thing that I didn't define before. We, we say the following thing, um, that uh, let's say the, the statement uh, has a degree d SOS proof. Which will denote by so that you can use degree d to uh, to prove uh, prove this statement. Uh, if uh, the following holds, there are uh, just polynomials p1 till pm, um, polynomials of degree at most d. Such that f of x equals some pi of x squared, but this only holds over the cube. So, so this is uh, this is uh, not exactly the same as uh, the uh, you know the uh, Minkowski's question, because we don't want, we don't we don't need this, uh, and we generally only ask this about. If, if functions that themselves have degree at most d. Let's say. typically the functions we are to talking about will have like this, uh, say, degree at most ten. So, uh, so notice that we don't uh, we, we don't uh, ask that f is equal to sum of pi squared as a polynomial in n real variables. We only ask that uh, f equals to uh, sum of pi squared uh, over the cube. But this is clearly enough to certify that f is non-negative over the cube. Okay. So, 
So, so let me say what are the basic properties of, uh, of, of these things, and then we'll go kind of one by one and either prove them or leave them as exercises. So, so one uh, basic property is that uh, the greedy proofs have at most n to the O of d numbers in them. So, um, so basically, what this means is that even though a priori I didn't uh, bound m, you never need more than um, clearly every polynomial of degree um, every polynomial of degree d has at most n to the d coefficients. Um, and uh, and what this says is that basically you don't need more than uh, n to the o of the polynomials. And that if there is a degree d proof, you can you need at most uh, n to the d po uh, polynomials. Now, if you want to properly count length of proofs, you have to also worry about bit representations. But we'll kind of ignore these issues at least for the beginning of this course. Maybe uh, most of the times they can be safely ignored, um, especially if you are not. You know, if you don't really care about the difference between certifying that f is uh, non-negative and f is at least minus epsilon. But um, so we'll kind of uh, ignore it. The second thing is that we can uh, check uh, a degree d proof in n to the o of d time. This is not immediately obvious because this is a statement that uh, a priori you need to check two to the n inputs to, to verify, but we'll see that you, you can actually efficiently check it. And the, the third thing which is more surprising, this is basically this, uh, um, a restricted version of this uh, sum of squares algorithm, is that you can actually find degree d proof in n to the o of d time. So not only can you check it, you can even find it. Uh, yes? When you talk about degree, is it total degree of a monomial, or the maximum degree of any variable in a monomial? It's the maximum degree of any, uh, any monomial. The sum of any monomial. So of any monomial, yes. x times y, is that degree 2, two or degree 2? It's degree 2. Degree two. Cool. x times y is degree 2, yes. Uh, yes. Um, property four is uh, that um, if f is actually non-negative, again, all, we are only over the cube here, so I'm not going to write it uh, every time, then you can always prove this fact with degree at most uh, 2n. So you never mo need more than uh, 2n degree. Which, if you think about it in light of what's above, it kind of makes sense because you, if f is no negative, you never need more than 2 to the n time to, uh, to verify that. So, so it may make sense that you, 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 you shouldn't spend like, more time, on, you know, significantly more time than that finding a, a proof of that. And, and then, we, yeah, and, 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 but what we show is that sometimes, We can show, uh, you know, we, we can we can certify this kind of thing with, you know, d much much smaller than n. So, some sometimes these these proofs can be very succinct, and what kind of nice about these sum of squares proofs is that they turn turn out to capture a lot of what we intuitively do uh, in mathematics. So a lot of uh, statements. Uh, a lot of say inequalities that we use and love all the time, like Cauchy-Schwarz, Felder's inequality, um, arithmetic mean, geometric mean, all these kind of things. They often they have a low degree sum of squares proofs. Okay, so let me. So let me go over these properties. So basically. Um, Property one, I uh, will leave it uh, as an exercise, but I will give you a hint. Um, you can basically say, uh, 
you can basically uh, say uh, represent f as a matrix and um, of n to the d by n to the d matrix of all possible coefficients and um, and, and, and this, is, this is going to be some, uh, basically, a condition. We'll see, basically, that uh, this is going to be a condition that uh, um, f is uh, that all the eigenvalues of this matrix are non-negative. And the number of these eigenvalues uh, is basically the rank of this matrix. And the rank will never be more than n to the d. So, but, yeah, but basically, probably you can do it in several ways. It's basically some linear independence argument that you really don't need more than um, uh, you really don't need more than n to the d n to the d terms, and it's related actually to step number two, where we say that even though this looks like two to the n conditions, this really is only. Uh, the, the, even though this looks like two to the n conditions, this really. Uh, uh, or it can be done in two to the n time, in uh, n to the d time, and the reason is the following. So, so we basically the idea is that uh, we say the following. So you have f equals g. So if you have two polynomials, f x equals g x for every x in zero one to the n. If and only if f equals g modulo xi squared minus xi for i 1 to n. So let me explain what, I'm, what I mean by this. Basically, what I mean is that, um, first of all, clear, uh, not, notice that over 0, 1 to the, uh, to the n, is, uh, 0, 1 to the n is characterized by the equations xi squared equals xi, right? So this is, an equa uh, this is an equation that only 0 and 1 satisfy. In particular, it means that um, if you take a polynomial and uh, every time you see a power of it, uh, every, every time you see a, 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 um, a variable squared, you turned it into a variable, just, um, you just remove the squared. And um, you know, inductively, if you see a power, uh, um, you can make all the power, every time you see a power variable raised to some, uh, some power larger than one, you make it one, then you're not going to change the value of this polynomial over the cube. So, uh, so clearly, if two, uh, if two polynomials, if two polynomials uh, agree, their coefficients agree, uh, uh, if, two poly if two polynomials, uh, um, the, the coefficients agree after you, we make them multilinear uh, polynomials, then they, um, then they agree over every x in the cube. And you can also show that this is uh, the other way around. That um, if they uh, disagree, yes? Yes. Yes, yeah, so like it's you know you write it as a polynomial, and uh, and then basically what we say is you can uh, take down uh, like if if you see there like a power like x i to the five you make it x i, and if after you do this to, uh, this thing the f and g agree to each other then they uh, then they agree with each other on every uh, point in the cube, if they don't uh, if they don't agree then there mu there can must be a point uh, which will differentiate between the two. And again, I leave the, this thing as also as a, like an exercise. So basically, uh, I've shown one direction that if this holds, then this holds. And, um, and you can also show the other direction. Uh, but in some sense, by the way, this direction, uh, the direction that I showed is enough here. So basically, if you wanted to check this equality, what you would do is um, you're given all these coefficients of all these polynomials. So you will reduce all these coefficients to uh, multilinear uh, multi uh, coefficients. You s and now you check that uh, the coefficients on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side are the same. So that's how we check. Um, and that's, how we, uh, that's how we check and that we, uh, we can do it. And let me, Three is the more complicated part, so let me uh, skip ahead to four and then go back to uh, and then go, and then uh, go back to three. 
So uh, number four is you want to say that if f is non-negative, we can always um, if f is non-negative, we can always uh, uh, prove it by a degree uh, two n sum of squares proof. And the idea is the following: we write the following, we define the following polynomial. Suppose f x is non-negative for every x. Um, then now we define define p of uh, p x to be the following uh, polynomial: u sum over uh, all y zero one to the n square root f y times pi i from one to n one minus x i minus y i. Uh, plus two x y I think uh, x i y. Okay, so let's uh, um, pass this. So p of x is a polynomial in x, and uh, let's try to understand what p of x does. Uh, so p of x is a polynomial in x. It's of degree, you know, this is linear. So if it's, it's of degree at most n, and let's try to pass uh, what it does. So basically, um, for every we, we run this over all y's. For every particular y, if one of the xi's is different from one of the yi's, say for example, if xi is zero and yi is one, then this thing will be zero and uh, this thing will be one minus one. So uh, this whole term will vanish. The only uh, the only case where this, this doesn't vanish is when x uh, uh, x uh, equals y. So basically what we get is that p of x will equal square root of f of x. So, so p of x is a polynomial of degree at most n that equals uh, square root of f of x. So another way to say it is that f equals p squared as a polynomial uh, over the cube. Yes? So we do have examples we'll, we'll see later. Um, yeah, but I can even give you like now an example that requires, I don't know if 2n, but let's say n over 10 or something like that. And this is the following polynomial. Suppose uh, n is odd. And define f of x equals uh, sum xi minus n over t, n over 2 uh, squared. Uh, minus uh, I don't know, one tenth or whatever, um, or maybe even this, but maybe even this, just this polynomial. Um, um, this polynomial is uh, um, okay. We, we want to show that it's not negative, so let's make it minus one tenth. Okay. So this polynomial is uh, th this polynomial because n is odd. And you can never get to n over 2, right? The, the closest you can be here is a half, and then you'll get here a quarter. So this polynomial is always at least um, you know, a quarter minus 1 tenth, uh, which is you know, it's calculable <laughs> by someone. Uh, and, uh, but it's a positive number. And uh, so this polynomial is positive over the cube, but uh, Grigoriev showed that, uh, the, that it requires degree uh, a constant times n to certify this fact. So this is like a, a nice example uh, of that. Notice that its polynomial is uh, arguably, I mean, it's a, um, if, if we change this one tenth to, uh, you know, uh, so we can easily certify that this polynomial, you know, is at most, um, um, you know, is at most minus one tenth in this case. So generally, like we could put here one quarter, it's at most minus one quarter. So in some sense, this is one of the, those cases where uh, it takes degree n to certify a certain bound. But if you wanted to modify this bound by a little, which is, you know, a, a constant is relatively small compared to the sum of coefficients of this polynomial, which is n. Then, uh, then you could get a bound with you know, a very, very small degree, but at the cost of getting somewhat weaker bound. So, so this example somewhat demonstrates both sides there. First of all, that sometimes you require to end, and sometimes you can do much better. Yes? For the random function, what, what is the thing for? So, so, so you find the random function at this 
not negative or I could do. Can I say that it requires so so random function is a little bit because we kind of want low degree uh, functions in some sense. Uh, in, uh, we, we kind of want uh, low degree functions, but in some sense, we, we, one of the answers is that we simply don't know. So here is like a, a, an open question. So suppose f is a random, I don't know, degree four polynomial. And what I mean by random, let's write f of x be sum over i, j, k, l, f i j k l x i x j x k x l where the f i j k l is just say random in plus minus one or gaussian whatever you know whatever you prefer and let's write this uh, now now uh, now uh, what do we know um, what we can uh, easily, uh, we can do kind of a probabilistic analysis to certify that uh, something like um, f, uh, that basically um, so something like that uh, f of x in absolute value will never be uh, larger than I typically will get it wrong, but let's try to see. Um, so basically, if we take uh, any particular x, if we take any particular, uh, any particular x, then uh, the sum of these uh, fi's it has mean zero, and uh, it has a standard deviation uh, standard deviation n squared, right? So, uh, and there are two to the n x's, so you'd expect like a square root n standard deviations, right? So you, it will be kind of like O tilde n to the 2.5, I think, right? That's the, the, the true maximum of the f of x on, on all the x's. Because you kind of expect that there would be at most um, the, the, the worst x would, be, uh, would kind of uh, make it like square root n standard deviations because this will be like 2 to the minus n probability. And so this we kind of know this to be true. So for example, you can write f of x, um, f of x my, uh, plus, uh, you know, something uh, like, I don't know, n to the 2.51, that will be a non-negative polynomial, but we don't know um, we don't know what's the best bound we can certify. So this is, uh, we have some weaker bounds. Uh, we, we have some weaker bounds, uh, like n, n cubed, I think we can certify with uh, like a degree for sum of squares proof, but we don't know, kind of don't know what the answer is, uh, at least not in general. So, so even this basic question, which in some sense, it's one of the first questions uh, like a smart student will ask, uh, you know, in a, when, when seeing this thing, we still uh, don't know how to fully answer, which is uh, why I think it's a very nice uh, research area. So, so let me... Um, Right. So let me. Uh, okay. So uh, let's. Okay. So now let's let's do number uh, three. So the only question is where. Uh, maybe I'll erase this board and do number three. So let's okay. So um, let's uh, so so basically what we want to do is the following. We said that uh, m uh, we can always assume that m is at most n to the o of d, and uh, we can assume that m say is equal n to the o of d because we can have you know zero polynomial. So we. Uh, so basically, a sum of squares proof is a, a sum of squares proof is a, 
is a, um, a vector of polynomials, of at most n to the O of d polynomials. Now, let's suppose that uh, f no, equals sum of uh, pi squared over the cubed, and f prime equals sum of pi uh, prime squared, then, uh, then if we take any uh, non-negative combination of f and f prime, like alpha f plus beta f prime, when they are non-negative, then uh, this basically equals uh, you know, sum of uh, you know, square root alpha pi, uh, square root alpha pi squared plus sum of square root uh, beta p prime j, maybe I should write, uh, squared. And we know that, uh, we, we, know that uh, we can also, th there would also exist uh, a sum of squares proof. So there would be some sum of squares proof. Uh, so th there is a sum of squares proof. Uh, and then we know that we can also find like one with at most uh, n to the d coefficient. So, so we can, so basically, if we can certify that f is non-negative and f prime is non-negative, then for every non-negative combination, we can also certify uh, with the same degree that uh, uh, with the same degree that uh, f is non-negative. So basically, uh, so basically, what we uh, if we can if we define say k d to be f such that you can certify in degree d that f is non-negative, then uh, this is what's called a, a positive cone. It's a, or a convex cone. It's, a, a, it's closed under any, um, it's closed under any convex combination and um, under any multiple by a positive number. So, and and basically, that suggests that you might be able to use uh, convex programming, but it's not immediate because you need some uh, you need something um, an efficient way to you need an, an efficient way to certify membership uh, in this cone. And and generally, the the way uh, the way this works is uh, is by what I alluded to before. And we and is written in more details in the lecture notes, and we also might go after uh, go later uh, into more details. But for now, let me say roughly how it goes. You basically for every uh, you want to say the the following thing. Um, F is equal to a sum of pi uh, squared if and only if there exists and n to the d by n to the d matrix M, such that uh, the coefficient f hat at a, uh, the coefficient, uh, so f hat s, this is kind of the coefficient, the, the, the coefficient that corresponds to s. Like uh, s is a subset of, uh, of n of size at most d. So f at s will be the coefficient of the monomial uh, that corresponds to xi, the product of xi when xi is in s. So even only if f at s uh, equals the sum over all, uh, over all a, b, uh, such that a union b uh, equals s of a, uh, M A B. So basically, uh, what it means is that uh, what it means is that if we if we think of this matrix, and we um, we think of it as an n to the d by n to the d matrix, or uh, and, and choose d by n cho choose d matrix, and uh, and we think of it as co corresponding to a polynomial which is of the following form, uh, M X is the sum over all a, a and b in n of size at most, uh, say, d or d over 2, I think, uh, maybe, uh, of size at most d over 2 of m a b x a x b. 
So M A B X A X B, that's the um, M A. Let me maybe try to let, let me write this uh, a little bit more properly. Okay, so so we want to write the following lemma. Or um, okay, let's start with a definition. So suppose that M is a matrix. Uh, is an n, uh, I'll write it this way, n less than d over 2 uh, times n less than d over 2 matrix. So it's a matrix indexed by sets of size at most n over 2. Then we can define uh, the polynomial Pm, polynomial corresponding to m, to be the following polynomial. Uh, you sum over all A and B that are uh, sets of size at most D over 2. And you write the code MA, XA, XB, where we write XS to be the product I in S, XI. And, and here is a, a, a lemma. If M is a matrix like that, which is PSD, then uh, PM equals some PI squared for some polynomials PI squared. And uh, what is the proof for this lemma? If M is PSD, then uh, M equals uh, some VI, VI transpose. Uh, right for some vectors vi, that's one definition of being a, a PSD matrix, one of the equivalent definitions. And now uh, m, uh, and now we basically just look at the polynomial, right? Vi, vi, uh, vi, 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 I suppose if we look at what the corresponding polynomial, then it's really uh, uh, this would correspond to uh, you know the polynomial pi x squared, where pi uh, where pi x is the sum over A of VI, the coordinate A, X, A. Right, so if M is PSD, then M, uh, PM is sum of PI squared. And uh, now, uh, basically to check, and, and, uh, and, and now basically to ch uh, it turns out that uh, if, if P is sum of PI squared, we can find the PSD matrix. We, we can use this to easily define a, PS, a PSD matrix such that uh, P equals PM. Uh, so basically what it means is that uh, P is this equal to the sum of PI squared if and only if there exists an M which is PSD such that PM equals P. Again, modulo uh, x i by ribua minus x i squared minus x i. Uh, so, uh, so basically, to check that uh, to check that p uh, can be proven non-negative by a degree d proof, we basically need to check um, that there exists a linear, uh, a pos uh, positive semi-definite matrix that uh, satisfies certain linear equations. And this is something, uh, this is not just a convex program, but in fact a convex program that we can do efficiently. So, um, so this is what's known as semi-definite programming. And, um, and I'm not going to, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to go into uh, now, uh, you know, the proof of semi-definite programming, but just maybe an intuition, uh, intuition why uh, why this would be easy as a, uh, is that you can test you can test if a matrix. Generally speaking, you can test if a matrix is positive semi-definite. You just do the eigenvalue decomposition and you see that everything is non-negative. So, so it is kind of an easy set to optimize over. Right, so now when we are working in this kind of Boolean thing, we, uh, we're not considering rational in some of squares, but we, we do have the power. We, we see that we don't need the rational in some sense. We can do everything. Uh, 
we can do any, uh, we, 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 we can do a refinite degree, because we are working in the Boolean domain, we can do a refinite degree every, uh, we can prove any, any polynomial to be non-negative um, uh, with a finite degree, and uh, be, because we do have this power of uh, kind of reducing modulo the ideal. But, um, Yes? But the degree could be lower if you use rational functions. Is that possible? Um, yes. Uh, uh, so I think with rational functions, it's a bit complicated. You, you probably want them to have kind of a common denominator uh, and kind of put the denominator next to the f. And then it's not, it's not clear if it, um, I don't know if you know, if it kind of gives you extra power. Um, in it does, but the denominators, I mean, in the unconstrained situation. Right. Yeah, but on the cube, I don't know if it's no. The cube, no, the cube it doesn't. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's. Uh, know about it. So Tuesday, 4 p.m. I'm going to give a high-level talk uh, about some of squares and particularly the Bayesian interpretation of it. Uh, so that would be somewhat of a more, of a more philosophical uh, high-level talk. Uh, well, here I try mostly to stick to the math, so uh, it should be. I think you will not be bored even if you go to that talk, uh, uh, because uh, there will not be much overlap, um, largely because that talk will be a little bit content-free. It will be mostly uh, philosoph philosophy and uh, general uh, proclamations. So if you don't like these kind of uh, ruminations, don't go to the talk, <laughs> regardless of whether you, <laughs> you are here or not. Uh, but uh, um, you, you might... Um, you, it might be interesting. Okay. Um, so, so generally speaking, um, the, the the ideal case is that we uh, we have a function. So let's let's focus right now on the, on the certification problem. We have a function that the, the true global minimum of it is zero. It's say it's uh, it's not negative. And ideally, what would happen is, you know, we have kind of a reasonable time budget. Maybe we can, uh, you know, run for, I don't know, n, n squared time. So we uh, run the sum of squares algorithm with d equals 2. And, uh, and ideally, what would happen is it will, you know, spit to us a degree d proof that uh, the function is non negative. And, and that would be, uh, so it would certify the true bound on the function with a small, uh, small d, and then we would be very happy. We, we solved the certification problem. But, uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, you can, you know, crank up this, uh, you know, Pablo's uh, software, uh, you know, put in the, the function, and you know, suppose you even might know that it's not negative for some other reason, or you know, you have good reasons to believe that it's not negative, and you try to get a proof that uh, you know um, um, that it's uh, that it's not negative, and the algorithm doesn't uh, doesn't uh, give you a proof. Basically, you know, you run it, the algorithm they will print an error message that more or less, in uh, in other words, will say something like. Uh, dude, this problem is NP-hard. You didn't expect me to solve it uh, in all cases, right? So, uh, right, we can't expect the sum of squares uh, algorithm to always output uh, a short proof that the function is non-negative because this is in general an NP-hard problem. But the nice thing about the sum of squares algorithm is that even when it doesn't output a proof, it outputs something. And now I want to talk about what that something is. What does it do when it fails to, to find the proof? So. Uh, and this is this notion of um, pseudo distributions. So, so what does it mean that we, it fails to fi uh, find a proof? So, uh, a proof? so we basically said that we have this set. This is the set KD of all the f's that uh, you can prove in degree d that f is non negative. And uh, um, failing to find the proof means basically that we have this function that happens to be non-negative, this, um, I don't know, f0, but it's not in this set. <coughs> so 
What we know uh, we, uh, is the hyperplane separation theorem. It says that you know, if you have a convex set and a point not in this set, then there is a hyperplane separating these two things. So what is, uh, what is the space? Just kind of remember what, what is the space we live in. We, we live in the space of all functions from 0, 1 to the n to r. Or in other words, we live in 2 to the n dimensional space. And um, so a uh, hyperplane like that, what, uh, uh, basically what it means is that uh, by the hyperplane separation theorem, what we know is that there exists some mu from 0, 1 to the n to r, such that um, the dot product of mu and uh, f is non-negative for every f in kd, but the dot product of mu and f0 uh, is negative. And uh, one of the functions that is in KD is the all ones function. Uh, we can, without loss of generality, assume that uh, mu, uh, the dot product of mu with the all ones function uh, is equal to 1. OK? So generally speaking, because it's a convex, uh, by a kind of co uh, convex uh, duality, the sum of squares algorithm, when it doesn't uh, give you an, a, a proof, it gives you this certificate that F0 is not, does not have a proof, and that certificate is simply this mu. So, so you either get out, um, so you either get, get a, a proof that F is not negative, or uh, this mu that certifies that uh, F doesn't have a degree D proof that uh, it's not negative. And Basically, uh, and, and this is what we call uh, a pseudo distribution. Now, let me try to uh, let me try to um, motivate this name pseudo distribution a bit more. So let's define. So we define pseudo expectation of f with respect to mu to be simply the dot product of mu and f, which is just the sum over all x in 0, 1 to the n of fx mu, or maybe mu x f of x. So I define this to be the pseudo expectation of, uh, of f with respect to mu. Notice that if mu was an actual probability measure, this would be the expectation of f according to this probability measure. And now we define mu uh, is uh, degree d pseudo distribution if uh, pseudo expectation of 1 is 1 and pseudo expectation of p squared is no negative for every uh, p of degree at most d over 2. OK, so, uh, so basically we want to say that mu is a pseudo distribution of degree d if uh, you know, it satisfies these two things. And, and um, right now it's just a you know, definition. Why, why do I call it a pseudo distribution? So first of all, notice that um, one, one missing thing that I didn't uh, re require is that mu of x is non-negative for every x. Now, if mu of x was non-negative for every x, then it basically it would just basically mean that it's, a, it's an actual distribution. Right? It, will, uh, it sums up to 1. Uh, uh, it's non-negative numbers. It's an actual distribution. If it was an actual distribution, then uh, in particular, the expectation of any square would be non-negative. So, so it's a very simple uh, fact. If mu is a distribution, then uh, it is also, uh, mu is also a d pseudo so distribution for every d. Um, so this is 
one fact. Um, another fact should, uh, that um, some, uh, that you, you can have some weak kind of corollary, and the following, uh, this is fact two. If mu is a degree 2n pseudo, uh, pseudo distribution, then mu is an actual distribution. And the proof of that is the following. You define, uh, you, you basically look at a uh, if it's a 2 n pseudo distribution, in particular, you know that uh, mu n of this thing that uh, we wrote before, um, um, pi um, i from 1 to n, 1 minus x i minus y i plus 2 x i y i say squared to make it a, a, a squared. So, so you know this, this is a square that then you know for every y, for every y this is, uh, for every y this has to be uh, non-negative. But this simply equals, because this vanishes on everything except uh, when x equals y, this simply equals mu of y. So you get so basically, if it's a degree 2 n pseudo distribution, then it has to be non-negative on, uh, on every y. And if it has to be non-negative on every y, then, then it is an actual distribution. Yes? Um, so these pseudo distributions in general will be, have a long description length, like, right, to the end? That's a great uh, question. Uh, when did I plan to get to that? Like, think. Uh, let's just hold on that in like for five minutes. I, I can give you the spoiler that we'll find a, a succinct representation for this uh, pseudo distribution. So, uh, but uh, but yeah, the way I'm describing right now, it's two to the n, but uh, we'll find n to the d length uh, succinct representation for them. Okay. So um, so so fact. Uh, Three, which we'll uh, maybe see, show an example later, but uh, um, there are, uh, just like there are statements that we cannot prove if short, uh, with uh, sm uh, small degree proofs, then there are also, there exist uh, D pseudo distribution if D, you know, if D is, uh, say, much smaller than N, uh, maybe N over 10, or I don't know, probably N will also be good enough. Then uh, there exists a D pseudo distribution mu that is such that mu is not, you know, mu, mu is not uh, an actual distribution. So you can have actually, like, pseudo distribution is a strict generalization of distributions. You, you, it can actually have sometimes these negative, um, you know, these negative pro uh, uh, probabilities. And, but some of the, uh, so basically pseudo distribution of this object that uh, sometimes behave like distribution and sometimes doesn't. And a lot of the, the understanding of some squares is basically understanding to what extent we can pretend our distributions and when we have to be more careful. And so now let's, Uh, and now let's talk about this notion of succinct uh, representation. For this, I'll make another uh, definition. So, make the following uh, definition. So let's just say, uh, let's write PD, the uh, polynomials, you know, from 0, 1 to the n to r of degree at most d. 
So we can think of PD as, you know, as a, it's basically, we can, almost, we can almost think of it as the same as R n to the D or something like that, or n choose D, or something along those lines. So it basically, it's a, linear, uh, it's a linear space of dimension roughly n to the D. And um, we, we, let's suppose that E is a linear operator, so E is a map from uh, PD to R. And it's linear. And we say that uh, it is a degree D pseudo expectation operator if E1 equals 1. So the, the one here and the one here are not the same thing. This is the polynomial that happens to be, you know, to have one as its uh, coefficient, its constant coefficient. This is the, you know, the number one, because this maps a polynomial into a real number. And um, E p squared is no negative for every p of degree at most d over 2. So, uh, so this is the definition of a pseudo expectation operator. And just note that uh, to specify a pseudo expectation operator, you only need n to the d numbers, right? It's a, like a linear, uh, a linear operator. So uh, you can just pick some basis for these polynomials, say the monomial basis, and uh, you just need to specify this value on, uh, on the basis. So this does have a succinct uh, representation. And then basically we want to say that uh, uh, there is in some sense an equivalence between pseudo distribution and pseudo uh, expectations in the following uh, in the following way. So first, this is kind of uh, basically by definition, if mu is a degree d pseudo distribution, then uh, you know if we define e to be if we define e to be you know, expectation, uh, we, we pseudo expectation we request with, with uh, respect to mu, then it is a degree d pseudo expectation operator. Right, so if mu is a degree d pseudo distribution, then uh, this linear operator that you take pseudo expectation with respect to mu satisfies these two conditions. That's basically by definition. But um, another uh, thing is that uh, it's also uh, in the other way around. Uh, uh, so uh, it's also the other way around that uh, here is another lemma. If uh, E is a degree the pseudo expectation operator, then there exists some mu that is a degree d pseudo distribution such that um, mu uh, such that uh, e equals e tilde mu. And the proof of this is basically, um, basically uh, these are just linear uh, equations on, uh, on mu, right? So you, ch uh, you, basically, um, you basically want the requirements, right? So you want to uh, you ch pick, you know, basis P1 till P capital N for uh, PD. And then you, 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 you have the equation, uh, you, you want the equation that, um, you know, mu dot pi equals e pi for i from 1 till capital N. N is like n to the d, much, much smaller than 2 to the n. So we, uh, these are, uh, you know, these are linear equations. Um, we know they can be satisfied because e satisfies them. So, um, so just, uh, you know, this is kind of an underdetermined version of a, a, a set of linear equations. We can find some mu that satisfies it. So, so basically, given a pseudo distribution, we can find a pseudo expectation operator that uh, agrees with it on all the low degree uh, polynomials. 
and given a pseudo expectation operator, uh, there always exists a, a, a pseudo distribution that, uh, that uh, would map to it. So if we don't care, and, and typically we don't because we would kind of get nonsensical results. So if we don't care about, if the only thing we care about given a pseudo distribution is what expectations it gives to us on low degree polynomials, then we can alwa always represent it in terms of n to the d, uh, n to the d numbers, and we have an equivalence between pseudo distributions and pseudo uh, and pseudo expectations. So if we consider mu and mu, mu prime to be equ equivalent, if they agree on all uh, low degree polynomials on all degree d polynomials, then uh, there is a one to one uh, mapping between these equivalence classes and pseudo expectation operators. And basically, uh, so, so as far as we are concerned, we basically can assume that these pseudo distributions have degree uh, d, um, you know, n to the d uh, sized representation. So does this kind of answer your question? Yes. Yes. The yes. that you chose might have negative inner power for the function. Your manner disk proof is not a sum of squares. So like on the first order property too, you said that. Ah, so, so typically we think that the function uh, we try to disprove also as degree at most d. Oh, okay. so, so it has to agree uh, on that function as well. So in some sense, another way to say, uh, right, so basically by the duality theorem, uh, we're basically uh, are saying that uh, a function uh, cannot be proven to have degree, uh, to be non-negative via degree d sum of squares proof, if and only if there is, exists a degree d pseudo expectation operator that gives that function negative expectation. And notice that uh, if, we speak, if we go with degree d all the way to 2n, then basically what we, uh, we know that a function is uh, non-negative. Uh, a function has a negative point uh, if and only if there exists some, ex distrib uh, some expectation, some distribution under which uh, uh, the function gets a negative expectation, right? Um, in particular, that distribution could be concentrated on that point. So when we go to degree, uh, so that's another way to say uh, in, so that when we go to degree to n, we can prove all the functions that are actually negative, we can uh, prove that they are non-negative. Because if we couldn't, there would have been an, uh, an actual expectation uh, that gives them negative value. But uh, when a function, uh, w what you can think is that, uh, you know, if a function is non-negative but it doesn't have a small degree, you can think of it as being kind of sneakily non uh, negative. It, it has some negative points, but uh, they're kind of, uh, oh, so, uh, sorry, if a function is, um, is not negative but it doesn't have a, a proof of that, then in some sense, uh, yeah, so, so in, in some sense, uh, yeah, we, we, it's hard for us to certify it. So, as far, uh, so in, in truth, there are, no, no, uh, uh, there are no negative points, but for us kind of bounded uh, observers that uh, cannot certify it, we kind of need to assume the existence of negative points because we cannot rule them out. So, um, you know, so, so basically, the best the best bounds we can give are weaker. So, uh, so we can, uh, so so basically, we have to kind of pretend uh, to us uh, kind of uh, mortal observers. That it seems as if there are actual negative points to this function. So, okay. So now I think we are basically. Uh, so we, we define so the distribution we define. Uh, uh, so the expectation, so now we're basically, I think, in a position to kind of uh, state this sum of squares algorithm. So we can remove this proof. So, so basically, uh, the, uh, so the Boolean uh, sum of squares algorithm Basically, uh, kind of theo uh, theorem uh, is basically uh, the following uh, the following claim, and I'm ignoring some numerical issues. And basically, for every d and for every f, which is degree at most d, let's say to avoid some trivialities, um, exactly 
one of following holes. So either you can prove with degree d sum of squares that f is no negative, or um, or um, there exists a degree d pseudo distribution mu such that it gives it negative expectation, and moreover can you know find one or two de depending on which one is the truth in uh, n to the o of d time. And generally, to make this an actual theorem, um, you know, the, the real theorem you will need here maybe you know put here some. Uh, uh, you you will want to say that uh, you know if if you cannot certify that it is at least minus epsilon, then you can find um, a pseudo expectation that gives it uh, at most uh, you know maybe plus epsilon for arbitrarily small epsilon, and uh, have some dependence on uh, you know the coefficients of this polynomial and some other, but. Uh, but uh, you know, let's ignore these issues of kind of numerical accuracy. And morally speaking, uh, most of the times we can pretend this is true as stated. So, what should, so why do we need to talk about pseudo distributions alone? Why you cannot just do pseudo expectations? So, in some sense, we can completely talk about pseudo expectations, and and mo most of the time, um, yeah, most of the time it's not necessarily useful to think. I mean. Somehow, uh, the, the, the thing that's kind of useful for us is to pretend the pseudo expectations are real expectations. And, um, and maybe it's, uh, so, so it's sometimes useful to kind of pretend that there is an actual distribution there. Uh, but it's mostly you know, for notational reasons, in some sense. Uh, because uh, just to give, um, in some sense, it's really for notational reasons. So we can, you know, we can talk about pseudo expectation with that distribution and that pseudo, you know, uh, uh, because otherwise you kind of want to give two names to, you kind of want to give two di uh, different names to different expectation operators, uh, and so pretend they correspond to different distributions. But uh, in, uh, yeah, in some sense, we kind of. There is this notion, I think you mentioned that once, that uh, there, there is, uh, and, and I think this is like, an, there is some analogy. Uh, there, there, I think there was this paper by uh, John Bell in, in, in quantum mechanics that uh, saying something about like uh, unspeakables in quantum mechanics, uh, uh, basically, that there are some quantities that uh, you, should, you cannot speak about, that basically say the uncertainty principle rules, you, rules out from speaking about a certain, certain quantities in uh, quantum mechanics. And in a similar way, in some sense, uh, a quantity like the expectation of a high degree, a degree higher than d uh, polynomial under a pseudo distribution is an unspeakable. You can define some number for it, but it's not really meaningful. And you can, uh, so, so, so in some sense, you should not, uh, you, you should not, you sh if you're taking expectations uh, under a pseudo distribution of a polynomial higher than d, then you're doing something wrong. You, uh, Yes. Ah. Oh, um, so, based on that, I was kind of wondering, um, in, in the practical sense, do you basically show pseudo distributions and rescale it to positive? So, so again, like. So, on, I guess more practically, when yes. you're thinking about pseudo definitions, can you rescale it to make it positive? So, so typically, okay. So that, that's 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 a, a very good question. In some sense, that's basically the. Um, in some sense, the next thing I, 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 I was going to say, what do we do in practice when we're given this pseudo distribution? And, and, and in some sense, we, uh, um, so, so let me just hold on to that bit and get the other question. And then, uh, yes. So what happens, uh, are there like weird like, uh, non-discrete domains where if you try generalizing you to like, some measure, like, you don't get a corresponding, like you don't get this value between like, pseudo yeah, so I think there might be like uh, so so it's not really about like the discrete like for example you can everything I did like in the boolean cube you can do over the uh, unit sphere 
I think if you have some domains where you don't have like very, uh, as, uh, the, the main thing that's important here is that we have this kind of a uh, very nice polynomial basis for this domain xi squared minus xi. Uh, when we don't have that, uh, some weirder things could happen, but we can then th at that point we basically do what Pablo says, we forget about pseudo distribution, we just talk about pseudo expectations. Um, so, we, because we don't have a good, we don't necessarily always have a, like a nice way to define pseudo distributions. Uh, so, in some sense, maybe pseudo distributions are like just a mental uh, crutch. Uh, so, feel free to, if if it hurts you more than it helps you, you know, feel free to go without. So, so given uh, expectation, can we distinguish it comes from a real distribution or pseudo distribution? That, that's a, 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 a another great question. Let me give also the, like, we'll talk about it, but let me give the spoiler that the answer is no. Um, it's NP hard. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll see why. Uh, yes. But let, let me go back. So, so, so to your question is, so we get this pseudo distribution. And in some sense, we don't like it. We want to make it a, a distribution. And, and the, the right way is, so, so, so typically, the, the way to make it into a distribution would not be to open it up to, to the 2 to the n coefficients and try to make it positive. But uh, rather, we want some kind of smarter way. So basically, what we, uh, so typically, um, this is the goal in uh, sum of squares based algorithm. So typically, the goal, in, you know, if you have some of, uh, of squares-based algorithm, suppose you're now, you, 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 suppose you're looking now not at the, uh, uh, you're looking not at the uh, task of certifying that f is, uh, you know, at least non-negative. You want to look at the task of actually finding the minimum element of f. So the typically, what you get is you you get. So you, you, what you want is basically what's known as a rounding algorithm. But the name, the name is kind of, uh, the, the name is not necessarily a good name. It's a kind of a name that comes because it's kind of, it can be looked at kind of a vast generalization of uh, simple algorithms for linear programs where, you know, to make a linear program into an integer program, uh, you know, find an integer solution from a solution of a linear program. But this is not really about integers or anything like that. Basically, what, what is a rounding algorithm? So, um, you know, it's an input is a pseudo distribution mu, where you know um, that gives to f some small values. Uh, you know, they give to f some value. Uh, let's call it I don't know um, alpha bar, uh, so give to, uh, give to f some, some, some small value. And the output would be an actual, uh, say, an actual distribution. And let's call it, I don't know, a row, such that, uh, you know, expectation with row of uh, uh, f is at most uh, alpha, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, alpha upper bar. And basically, in some, some sense, the integrality gap is basically this difference. So, uh, so basically, uh, you, your goal is to try to find the minimizer. And uh, you are given some, some distribution that kind of pretends to be a distribution over things that are very small, and like that uh, give you some kind of minimum element. And what you typically want is to output one guy, or maybe some, if it's a randomized rounding algorithm, typically it will be a distribution over guys that, uh, that is not too far from what you, you were promised. Um, typically, you, you will not be able to, you know, you, um, you cannot really hope uh, alpha, alpha upper bar will always be larger than alpha small bar because you cannot hope to get something out of nothing. Uh, and uh, it's kind of problem dependent on how, how big this gap is going to be. But this is basically where the, like the design of, uh, like the, in, especially the analysis in some sense. If you want to know the, uh, you kind of want to, to know the analysis, if you kind of prove, suppose you prove that generally um, an algorithm like that, that always guarantees that alpha bar, uh, you know, upper bar minus alpha lower bar is at most one. 
just give some arbitrary number. Then you kind of know that uh, the sum of squares algorithm, uh, the bound that it certifies for you is at most by one off from the optimum. Because uh, you, you know that if it gave you a bound that's uh, too low, there would actually be a minimum a an element that's only one bigger than that. So, uh, so this kind of, uh, when, when, you, when you show a rounding algorithm and you certify some bound, and sometimes we look at these kind of integrality gap, it's kind of, again, like a general name. It's not always that we want to subtract alpha bar from alpha, you know, alpha over bar from alpha low bar. Sometimes, we, you know, we want to compare them by some other function. But, uh, but generally speaking, this is kind of like, uh, we kind of want it to be uh, as close as possible. And, um, and when we have negative results, these are results showing that uh, it can sometimes be very, very big, uh, the difference between uh, these two. So, so this is, in some sense, uh, a, lo a lot of the time, basically, when you're trying to analyze and you want to show that the pseudo distributions are not too far from actual distributions, uh, so they cannot be too crazy, then that's what you want to show. You want to show that you can map. And, and, the, and the map might, might sometimes be trying to kind of really sample from the pseudo distribution in some sense, but sometimes it can you know, do things that are somewhat different. Yes? Is f also part of the input, or is this over all f? No, typically, um, f is some sense part of the input, the rounding algorithm, yes. The rounding algor algorithm knows f. Um, but generally speaking, you probably, if, if you want to show an integrality, uh, a bound on the integrality gap, you would restrict your f to a certain family. So for example, you would say, you know, f corresponds to uh, the maximum cut of some graph. And, and you look at the family of all functions that correspond to, to some cuts, and you want to say, uh, you know, say minimizing f corresponds to maximizing the value of the cut, and now you want to say that uh, uh, the gap is not too big, that if, uh, you know, if you have a pseudo distribution that pretends to be a distribution of a very, very good cut, then uh, you can find an actual distribution that is over a decent cut. And, and let me say, uh, maybe I'll kind of uh, jump to uh, like one of the main um, let me uh, maybe show you one of one of the main tools that we uh, that we actually use to to do these things. So, so in some sense, we want to find. So, uh, and, and, and this is related also to Lay's question. We kind of we given. Um, so, so some sense uh, here are some computational questions. So, so in some sense, a lot of the questions we ask is how close are pseudo distributions to actual distributions. And so here are kind of two uh, computational questions that are very natural for us to ask. So here is a. Uh, uh, so question, uh, so, so if it, we are given a, a pseudo distribution mu, um, you know, degree d, let's say, let's uh, given degree d pseudo distribution mu, um, ask the question, is there an actual distribution? Uh, an actual distribution uh, um, row such that, uh, you know, uh, the uh, expectation with rho of p equals expectation with mu of p for all p in pd, like, right? So for every polynomial of degree at most d, so, so you can ask if you have a, 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 a pseudo distribution, is there an actual distribution? So uh, we know that no, it's not always the case, but is there an algorithm to say if that's the case or, no, or, or not? And, and generally find uh, such a distribution. So, um, so, so basically the kind of 
generally the answer will be kind of the, uh, kind of depressing. Uh, no, the answer is uh, generally like uh, the generally our cases where there is no actual distribution that agrees with it, and it's also hard to tell whether there is a distribution or there isn't. And uh, and it's also in, in given that it's hard to tell whether there is or there isn't, it's also hard to find one if there exists. So so generally um, the answer is uh, bad, but there is one uh, kind of very useful tool, uh, which is actually also used a lot in practice. Uh, which is this uh, quadratic sampling lemma. And basically what it says is uh, the answer is yes if we restrict to d equals 2 and um, allow, uh, uh, allow rho to uh, range over Rn. So basically, even though we kind of maybe want the distributions over 0, 1 to the n, we, might, we need to allow rho to range uh, over Rn. And we, uh, and, and we can only do it where the, for degree equals 2. But this is still a, 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 a very useful uh, thing. Let, let me, in a second, state it kind of more formally. Uh, but um, uh, but this is, uh, this is still a very, very uh, useful lemma. In, in, in fact, uh, we use it in rounding algorithms. People also uh, even use this uh, in practice. Um, I think, for example, in finance a lot of the time. So basically, the, the, uh, the way they think about it, I think, in uh, finance, and also like, uh, let's say, maybe uh, an example that's more uh, relevant right now, um, I don't know exactly. Th this is, uh, I know people use this in finance. I, I'm pretty sure that uh, this is also used by, uh, say, would Nate Silver in 538, but uh, I'm not 100% sure. But I'm guessing that he probably does something like that. Like, you know, they have a matrix um, of correlations between different states or maybe different populations, et cetera. I would say, you know, they know that, uh, you know, Pennsylvania, uh, maybe has some relation with Ohio, and then there is some correlation with New Jersey or whatever. So they have this kind of matrix of, uh, of correlations between states. And then they have uh, you know, some expectation of, say, the number of votes that uh, Clinton will get in each state. Uh, and now they want, to, uh, you, they want to sample a distribution over all the 50 states that uh, will agree with these correlations and these expectations. So this is a simplification of what it does, but I think, I think something like that has to be at the heart. Yes? Me? Yes? Okay. Uh, I have a question about the quadratic sampling. Yes. I feel like uh, when rho is defined on the Rn, then I mean, there might be multiple polynomials that have uh, exactly the same values as a, at a grid point, but not over the Rn. Mm -hmm. So maybe two No, so, so Rho is a concrete, so I'll, I'll state the sampling lemma uh, more precisely, but Rho is an, a, a concrete distribution, right? So basically, given mu, the sampling lemma gives you a Rho, a distribution. Once the distribution is fixed, the expectation value is fixed. So it will give the same expectation for the polynomial. It's true that it will give this expectation in a somewhat cheating manner because it, it, what it uses is the trick that even though the polynomial is we kind of intended for it to only be applied on the cube. It's a polynomial. You can, you know, feed real numbers to it and see what comes out. But it will be a single number. You know, Rho will make it a single number. But it's true. It makes life easier for us that we allow this flexibility. I mean, you can simply, like, uh, for x1, replace all x1 with x2, and then you have the same Ah, OK. Yes. So this is uh, only polynomials, multilinear polynomials, let's say. Only multilinear oh. polynomials. Uh, also, uh, maybe life is simpler here because uh, we take degree at most two. So the, you know, if the, the total degree is at most two. So they can have coefficient. I mean, it doesn't have to be made even multilinear in this case. They can have xi squared. Or, yeah, but let's say it's only multilinear or so to make life uh, simpler. But uh, yes, so that's, that's a good point. So, 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 so basically, um, maybe I should state the lemma and then go back to say, so, uh, like saying how 
something like silver would use it. So basically, the lemma would say the following. Uh, for every degree uh, to uh, pseudo expectation operator E, uh, there exist, you know, uh, over R n. So the, the pseudo expectation operator uh, is over R n. There exist um, um, uh, for every uh, such uh, pseudo expectation operator. There uh, exists um, an actual multivariate Gaussian distribution. And let's, maybe I'll give it the name. Uh, okay, so rho, maybe I'll just give it the name, you know, some random variables, let's call them, I don't know, y1 till yn, such that. Um, you can write it in the monomial basis, right? Expectation of y i equals the uh, you know the actual expectation of y i equals the what the operator gives for uh, you know the polynomial x i uh, and the actual expectation for uh, y i y j gives what the operator gives for the polynomial x i x j. OK, so this is the quadratic sampling lemma. It says, and we can find it, right? So, so it says, given uh, a degree two pseudo expectation operator, you can find an actual distribution that matches uh, these moments. And, and the way people, I think, people use it in practice, say, for an example, something like that, you kind of, uh, you're faced with, you know, suppose you know the correlations between states and the expected, um, the expected vote uh, for, say, Clinton in each state. And now you want to uh, compute the probability that uh, Clinton wins the presidency. So the probability that Clinton wins the presidency is somewhat of a complicated event, right? Because it somehow, uh, it depends on getting, uh, like, uh, what's the probability that you get a certain subset of states that add up to 270 electoral votes. So it's not exactly well defined from just from these uh, pairwise correlations and these expectations. But somehow, you know, they have to come up with a number. So uh, what do they do? They take, you know, take these uh, this matrix of coefficients uh, of correlations and the expectation, and they probably throw in some other hacks, etc. But basically, they come up with some distribution that matches these moments, and uh, and then they can sample from this distribution of the total, you know, number of votes or fraction of votes, and uh, and decide based on that. Like in how how many times they you know they sample you know a vector of like fifty dimension fifty, and they add up, and if that vector comes up to be, uh, you know if they they add up the the state she wants is more than ten to seventy, they said well he, she won that, otherwise they said she didn't win, and um, you know and then they output the fraction of the times in their simulations in their sampling from this thing, that uh, they. Um, that you want. Now, I'm pretty sure they will do something a little bit more complicated than that, but the basic idea is along these lines, because you kind of have to, you, you, you need to find a dis an actual distribution. You're given some uh, partial information, some partial uh, correlations or moments, and you need to find uh, a distribution that matches these moments. Yes? Is saying that rho is in the dual cone uh, to our original cone, is that a, uh, proved by uh, part one? Oh. So rho is uh, okay. So I'm not sure if, you, if it's dual. It's in some sense, it's in some sense a subset, right? The actual distribution that match pseudo, pseudo distribution is a generalization of distributions. So in, in some sense, the the set of uh, actual distributions that match a certain moments is like a subset of the set of actual uh, of pseudo distribution that matches these moments. So it's not exactly you. So let, let, let me prove this. It's actually pretty simple. So the proof is the following. We know, uh, we know that uh, it's a pseudo expectation operator. So we know that for every uh, degree 1p, so this is simply you know, the polynomial sum pi xi, we know that e p squared, which is 
basically sum i j um, p i p j e x i x j. So we know this is non-negative, right? This is a pseudo expectation operator. It needs to give non-negative degree two. It needs to give non-negative. Uh, yeah. In fact, let me. Okay, let me start by even. Uh, um, so so we. Um, let me even uh, start. Just make my life simple. Uh, by shifting, let me just assume that uh, you know exi is zero uh, for every i. It's not really important. Just makes like, like uh, you can always shift to get this the case. So uh, let's just assume that. So um, so now uh, e. Um, so so th uh, what this really means is that if we define the matrix M i j to be e of x i x j then M is a PSD matrix, right? Um, the, because basically for every vector P, uh, P transpose MP is non-negative. So now um, we can choose um, some standard Gaussian. Um, so we can write M to be uh, some lambda i v i v i transpose, where the lambda i's are non-negative. And now uh, we can choose some standard Gaussian z, z1 till zn. And, uh, and, now, uh, and now what we do is we Basically, uh, what we want to do is we define um, y, uh, y to be the vector that is obtained by uh, taking um, square root m times z. Or in other words, it's the vector uh, that you get by taking sum of square root lambda i. Um, v i times the dot product of v i and z. OK, so at least, uh, so we, we uh, so I showed you how to sample from this distribution. You sample a standard Gaussian. Uh, you know, every entry is independent uh, normal variable with uh, expectation 0 and deviation 1. And, and and now you, uh, and now the way I output, uh, and now the way I uh, compute y, is I basically take the sum of uh, you know square root lambda i times uh, v i and times the dot product of v i and, uh, and this vector z. Or another way to think about it, if we think of z as a column vector, I simply apply the matrix square root m. Like a matrix square root m is basically the same matrix where we square root the eigenvalues uh, to z. And now um, the only thing is to verify that we match the moment. So we want to ch uh, verify. We want to show that uh, y i. So what we want to show is that expectation of y i y j is m i uh, m i j. But um, so, but generally, um, so we want to show that uh, expectation. And if we if you think of y as a column vector. Then we want to show that expectation of y y transpose is equal to m. And uh, and that would basically be uh, right. So expectation of square root m z square root m uh, z uh, transpose. And uh, by some manipulations, it will be uh, m. Right, square root m times square root m is m. Uh, by this kind of, uh, I see some, there are some physicists here. So um, clearly, if the dimensions match, all the transposers will be OK. So we don't have to worry about them. 
So it will be like expectation uh, ZZ transpose. So what is expectation of ZZ transpose? This is a standard Gaussian. ZIZJ is equal to 1 if I equals to J and 0 otherwise. So this is just the identity matrix. So basically, it will be M times the, uh, the identity matrix. So these are kind of like uh, linear algebra manipulations that if you are not as uh, you know, used to them, then uh, you know, they could seem like magical, but there is nothing really deep going on. It's, you, can, uh, you can also do the calculations. Uh, if I do the calculation, I always get it wrong, but eventually like, you, know, you, you do the I and J's and, and, you, and, and you'll see this thing. So it's, it's actually kind of uh, very, uh, very simple. And generally, uh, what it means is that, um, you know, um, um, you know, ge generally, uh, what what it means is that basically we can, um, you know, so so we can uh, sample at least we can match the first two moments if we allow ourselves uh, to if we allow ourselves this uh, flexibility of coming up with a real number rather than a, you know a zero one value, and. Um, and this is used, uh, like I said, uh, this is used in some practice. Let me not, you know, uh, just if I post this online and uh, Nate Silver comes suing me, I don't know if that's what they use. I have no idea what they actually use in uh, 538. I definitely know that some, uh, sometimes in finance, uh, and again, you have like similar situation. You might have like somewhat complicated financial product uh, that depends on a lot of underlying uh, assets or uh, markets. And you know some correlations between these markets, and now you want to maybe uh, estimate uh, the probability that something bad happens to to your compli uh, complicated product. So you want to s find some way to sample tons of uh, simulations uh, that uh, agree with you, with the information that you know. And, uh, right. So we had this question, and uh, and we said, okay, the, the quadratic sampling. Uh, Lemma it gives us uh, one, one answer to this question. We can do it with degree uh, two. So, uh, but this was a very, very, you know, this was a very simple proof. We can uh, basically, you know, uh, not only we can do it, uh, you know, with degree two, probably, you know, I don't know, Gauss could have done it, I mean, uh, with the knowledge of the time or, or you know, whatever. Like, it's, it's kind of very, uh, we, we can do it uh, with uh, fairly simple tools. So you might ask, well, maybe, you know, just work a little bit harder and you can do it with d uh, equals uh, 3 or with, uh, you know, d equals 2 and, uh, and Boolean output. And generally, the answer is no. And, you know, before proving that uh, the answer is no, let me, uh, let me tell you why the answer should be no. why there would not be a zero one uh, a quadratic uh, sampling lemma. So, so for every graph, uh, so given a, a graph G, we can define um, FG from zero one N to um, let's say R such that um, f g of x is equal, uh, say, to um, I don't know, a minus. I think we probably have like a nice. Def I'll write some definition, but there's probably like a nicer definition, uh, right? Um, um, so let's see. Uh, so write mi minus i, you know, is a neighbor of j. Uh, i is a neighbor of j. X i minus x j squared. Okay. So this is a degree two polynomial, and um, it's smaller. The uh, so if 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 you think of a vector x as a, basically a cut of the graph, then uh, the minimizing this polynomial is like maximizing the cut. Right? So, um, and uh, max cut is an NP hard problem. So basically, uh, we know that uh, there exists a G such that, uh, you know, me computing mean uh, of, 
generally, we, we, there is no general uh, way to compute the minimum. Uh, mi so uh, we, there is no general algorithm, uh, efficient algorithm to given G to compute uh, the minimum of uh, the, the minimum of uh, uh, of FG. So now uh, let's let's try to understand what what this means. Um, it it means that so claim um, there exists a G and a, a pseudo distribution uh, and a pseudo distribution mu of a claim that for every uh, for every d which is uh, much much smaller than n there exists a, a g and a pseudo distribution mu that uh, a degree d pseudo distribution mu such that uh, the expectation uh, with respect to mu, the pseudo expectation with respect to mu of uh, fg is smaller than the actual minimum over all x of fgx. Okay, so um, why, uh, why is that the case? Uh, suppose, uh, suppose there was a Suppose for the sake, I don't know, let's say, let's start with for every constant g. Okay, so for every constant d. So suppose there was a constant d, uh, that, that this was false. So suppose there was a constant d such that for every graph uh, and every uh, mu pseudo distribution, then uh, for, and for every uh, graph and for every uh, pseudo distribution, the expected value on fg was at least the minimum. Okay, so maybe I should uh, do it slower because this is kind of the first proof of, uh, okay. Okay, so suppose otherwise. So just because there are some several quantifiers, so uh, let's see. So then there exists some d0 such that for every graph g, and for every pseudo distribution uh, d d zero pseudo distribution mu uh, expectation mu uh, f g um, is uh, at least the minimum of uh, of x of f Gx. So if that if that was the case, then uh, uh, by duality we know that uh, by duality we know that we can prove in degree d zero uh, we we can prove that f uh, f g is larger um, than the minimum over all d pseudo distributions mu right so so generally we might not be able uh, so let's just again kind of try to stop and pass these things pseudo distributions are more general than actual distribution if i take the minimum of expectation of fg over all actual distributions what do i get here Just minimum of fg, right? Because the actual distribution that would minimize it is just the one that's concentrated on the minimal element. So this is a minimum of a richer set. I'm allowing not just actual distributions, but also pseudo distribution. This generally could be smaller. But under this assumption, this actually equals the actual minimum. So it means that there exists, a, a, so what, basically what we have proven here is that for every, uh, for every uh, graph G with, you know, max cut G equaling some value alpha, we can 
certify with degree D0, uh, so under the, our assumption with degree D0 uh, proof that the max cut uh, G is at most alpha. And uh, we clearly cannot certify that this is less than uh, alpha because you know it, this is not true. So basically what it means that we can certify the correct value of the max cut, we, we can prove the, the uh, so basically what it means that if we search um, you know, we can do a kind of binary search. This uh, max cut value can only range over, like, uh, you know, uh, not even binary search. We can, the max cut value, um, you know, it's only if there are m edges in the graphs, the max cut is between 0 and m. So we can, uh, we can see what is the best value that we can certify. And, and, then, uh, and then that would compute for us the, the true max cut value. But, you know, max cut is an NP hard problem. Uh, so if p is d different from np, then uh, this should not be the case. So, so this claim is really under the assumption that p is different from np, which is of course you know a stronger, you know, a more believable assumption than uh, you know two plus two equals uh, four or whatever. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but under this axiom, uh, 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 so this already suggests to us that uh, there should be, uh, th this already suggests to us that the, uh, this, this claim should be true. And now basically we want to also uh, prove this claim unconditionally. But, um, and we can. Uh, but, but, but this is also a kind of a general, uh, a general paradigm for, uh, for understanding these things. Sometimes we take a, a hardness, a computational hardness result it gives us certain predictions. For example, we, uh, we even believe that uh, not just P is different from NP, but we actually cannot really boot, beat uh, boot force for NP. So that would, uh, uh, that would suggest that this thing should be true not just for constant D, but for D that is you know, very uh, maybe square root N or something like that. It still, it still should be true that we cannot compute the max cut exactly. So, uh, and, and indeed one can prove that. So uh, people have been doing this basically translating uh, computational hardness results that are, uh, are uh, into unconditional uh, hardness results for the, uh, these uh, semi-definite programs. So, so now let's, uh, you know, show a, a concrete or at least somewhat show in the sense that, uh, at least um, state um, with this, uh, these examples. Um, so, so here is the. So basically, you can take you, you can take actually like say very simple graph. And let's see where is this example? Ah, yes. So here is um, kind of a very uh, just simple example. So you take um, um, the free cycle, and no matter uh, how you cut it, you cannot cut all three edges, uh, right? So um, in this case, um, we know that uh, fgx is at least uh, right, so fgx is at least um, is at least minus two uh, for every x in zero, one to the three. And uh, so, if you take degree, uh, you know, I don't know, degree six pseudo distribution, obviously we will certify this thing. But uh, you can show that there is a degree two distrib uh, pseudo distribution, and. Um, let me just kind of uh, write what it is without uh, uh, proving. Uh, um, so basically, uh, the degree, uh, the degree t pseudo distribution has uh, expectation. The degree two pseudo distribution has expectation uh, x i equals. Um, uh, expectation x i equals half. And expectation um, x i 
xj um, the way um, the way the uh, what is the, the expectation let's let me just write this this way expectation of x1 minus x2 squared equals expectation of x2 minus x3 squared equals expectation of so it, it is in the notes exactly how you get it uh, 3 minus x1 squared so this is the the three ages uh, equals uh, three quarters so basically uh, this pretends to uh, so instead of cutting, uh, th this pretends to cut not, uh, uh, this, this pretends to cut uh, like three times uh, three quarters of the edges. Uh, so it has expectation uh, three times three quarters, which is um, nine over four, which what is important for the, uh, about nine over four that is larger than two. So, so you can define a valid degree to pseudo distribution and the proof that it's PSD um, is uh, you know in the lecture notes, but uh, the the point is that basically this is a degree two pseudo distribution, and um, it pretends as if you can cut uh, in expectation it, ca it kind of cuts uh, n uh, you know uh, nine over four of the uh, nine over four like two point uh, you know two point twenty five edges rather than two edges, so we kind of know that there is no actual distribution that would match. Uh, we know that there is no actual distribution that would match these uh, parameters. So this is kind of a very simple example of a distribution that you can't match the moments. But also, these kind of NP hardness results would also tell you that the generally you, you, the, the question whether uh, you can or cannot match the moments of a pseudo distribution is NP hard. Uh, because yes, because if you could solve that question, then again, uh, you could solve the max cut question. You could uh, basically search for uh, you know, uh, the pseudo distribution that doesn't, uh, that, that matches uh, uh, a pseudo distribution that actually has a corresponding, uh, um, or at least, le let's say, at least you could have like a small certificate, a short certificate, that the max cut is, uh, that the max cut uh, value is, uh, is bounded by given uh, some moments, and then um, you can run the algorithm to verify that the moments correspond to an actual distribution. So this is basically still a, a hard question to given some moments to find out whether or not they come from a distribution. So. And, and we'll see, uh, so right now these are still kind of uh, qualitative statements in the sense that, uh, so this basically just says that you cannot do it exactly. But uh, typically what we are uh, interested in is whether given some, uh, uh, whether, whether given some, uh, yes? I don't know if it's just an example. I'm trying to understand how the dx of i equals one half then implies that those three Ah, they don't, it doesn't imply, I, you, you know, this only defines the, right, so basically uh, this only defines, uh, th this is a partial definition of the moments. So, so, so yes, it doesn't, it, 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 this is a partial definition of the moments. In the lecture notes there is uh, like basically, uh, you know, the covariance matrix, the, the covariance matrix of this thing is uh, basically, um, the covariance matrix of this thing is, uh, uh, I think one quarter minus one quarter. Uh, uh, so minus one eight, minus an eight. So this behaves as if it's like uh, you toss three unbiased coins, like the cat behaves as if you tossed three unbiased coins. Uh, and, and there is some negative correlation uh, between, uh, between uh, you know, this coin and this coin, et cetera. Like the, and there is, there is some ne negative correlations between uh, these two coins. And the negative correlation is such that uh, this matrix is still PSD, but it's actually more negative that you can actually achieve uh, in any real distribution. Right, so, uh, so basically it behaves as if you have like you toss three coins where every pair uh, dis of distinct coins has probability three quarters of being uh, different. 
And, um, and this matrix still uh, turns out to be PSD, so it is a degree two pseudo distribution. If it, uh, but it is, uh, but but there is no uh, there is no actual uh, distribution of three coins that can achieve this. Yes. You said that if we could check whether uh, there is a distribution for smaller. Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah, so basically, um, the the idea would be. Um, okay. So. Um, um, okay. So let's see. Um, might you might be right that it's okay. It's definitely computationally hard to to check I if a distribution satisfies the moment. So what's the easiest way uh, to see this? So. Uh, you um, so that's uh, okay. So that's a good question. Uh, what I think uh, you um, Yes, so I think it might not be, uh, yes, I, I think it might, uh, okay, so let me, uh, yeah, may, may, let me think a little bit. I, can, I think there is definitely like some computational hardness, uh, or even for the problem of, you know, just given a set of moments, does there exist a, a distribution uh, that matches them? And, um, uh, maybe even uh, right. So, so, but but it might actually uh, yes. Maybe for uh, yeah, but it might require a, a little bit of uh, work to show it. Uh, yes. So so um, so let me get back uh, on on this. So. So basically, uh, so 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 pseudo distributions somehow may, may behave like uh, can be very different than distributions. So you might kind of say, why do I kind of give them these names, and why do I uh, um, imagine that they're distributions? And basically, the 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 reason is that even though they even though they are not exactly distributions, they, they still satisfy some nice properties. So. Uh, and we still can sometimes uh, pretend that uh, there are distributions. So, so we've seen some bad examples. Let's say some some good examples. So, for example, we can prove uh, you know. So here is one theorem. You know, for every degree. I'm not sure, like 2D, I don't know, uh, pseudo distribution mu, whatever the degree needs to be, so uh, this thing makes sense. And uh, let's say P and Q that are degree at most D, then uh, the expectation, the pseudo expectation of uh, P, Q uh, is smaller than the square root of pseudo expectation of p squared, so the expectation of q squared. So, uh, so we have Cauchy Schwarz. Um, so we, uh, so 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 we have Cauchy Schwarz. This is one nice thing that the distributions have. So this the, the pseudo distribution also has it. And the way you prove it is the following. You know, you can scale things. So you know. Without loss of generality, uh, this is kind of a scale uh, invariant inequality. So, without loss of uh, uh, loss of generality, we can assume that ex pseudo expectation of p squared equals pseudo expectation of q squared equals one. Right. So now we need to prove that uh, uh, pseudo expectation of p q is at most one, and we know that pseudo expectation of uh, uh, p minus q squared is no negative. After all, this is right, what pseudo-expectation does. And that equals to 
pseudo expectation of p squared uh, minus a uh, plus pseudo expectation of q squared minus 2 times pseudo expectation of um, pq. Right, so we know this is no negative. Uh, if this is 1 and this is 1, this means that this guy can be at most 1. Right? So, uh, so we get Cauchy Schwarz. And, and, and generally, um, and, and generally, we'll see more and more examples like that uh, in this course. Where, uh, more and more examples where, the, uh, uh, where we could, uh, where um, um, for things that we kind of prove about uh, distributions, uh, with, you know, Cauchy Schwarz, AMGM, all these kind of uh, things, and uh, even um, and, and even more sophisticated things like hypercontractivity and uh, invariance principle, uh, etc. We can we can uh, 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 if we have a sh uh, if we have a proof mathematical proof of the of that fact, with, uh, it often turns out even if the mathematical proof is complicated, it, uh, it can be like you know a great paper and I mean literally an annals of math paper, it still can be that the proof itself is a low degree uh, sum of squares proof. In fact, the, the, main, uh, the main way to generate uh, examples that are kind of robustly uh, not sum of squares provable uh, is using the probabilistic method. Uh, and which maybe explains why you know it took so much time uh, for people to come up with uh, you know concrete examples uh, for Hilbert's question. And even those concrete examples were like somewhat uh, like Motskin's example is was somewhat kind of uh, fragile uh, that uh, it required very low degree rational functions. So in some sense, if you stay away from a probabilistic method and uh, your proof doesn't do that, uh, if your proof doesn't uh, use kind of the Chernoff plus union bound uh, type arguments, typically it will be um, um, uh, typically it will be um, uh, it will be uh, SOSable. So basically, the, there is uh, two main uh, there are, uh, basically two two main tools that we use when we do a kind of uh, sum of squares research. And this is uh, related to each other. This is uh, Marley's paradigm. So Marley's paradigm is basically if you if you stay away from the uh, probabilistic method, then every little thing is gonna be all right. <laughs> so don't worry. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, uh, so basically, um, y so, so typically the way we, it would work is uh, uh, the, the way it would work is that you analyze, uh, say, a rounding algorithm while pretending that the pseudo distribution is an actual distribution, and you do all your proof, and then you go back to the proof and uh, and, and uh, SOS it, and and. And, and the idea is that um, as long as you didn't use the probabilistic method, you, um, it will be OK. And uh, you will be able to show that even though, uh, so, so you basically, the idea is that you kind of you take a rounding algorithm. So you pretend you're given uh, the moments of actual distribution mu over uh, x such that, let's say, you know, f of x is smaller than some alpha bar, uh, lower bar. And let's say, use that to find maybe some x X upper bar with uh, you know with uh, f x bar upper bar at most alpha bar, and then uh, uh, and then you go and you look at the analysis of the algorithm, and if you didn't in the in your proof, so you kind of uh, so you suppose you prove that uh, you know alpha uh, that 
you, you prove some bound delta on the integrality gap. You prove that uh, alpha uh, upper bar is at most delta worse than alpha lower bar. Then uh, you go and look at the proof of this statement and, uh, and then try to see that uh, maybe in the proof of this statement, you only use things like Cauchy Schwarz, et cetera, right? The, I mean, this statement at the end of the day is an inequality. And how do we prove inequalities? I mean, we use Cauchy Schwarz. I mean, I mean, we are like dumb computer scientists. We don't know how to do anything else. So, so you know, so, so if this inequality, you only used it by basically using Cauchy Schwarz, Helder, and all these kind of things, then uh, even though you proved it uh, uh, pre uh, in your mind, you thought that it was an actual distribution, it will still be true for a pseudo distribution. And, uh, and therefore, you will conclude that uh, even if you were given not a moments of an, an, uh, an actual distribution, but a moments of a, a pseudo distribution, you would still output a guy with at most delta worse than uh, the value that you got. So, so this is kind of uh, a, a general paradigm in, in kind of designing um, rounding algorithms for some of squares. And one way I like to think about it is like it's a, a, a non-type safe uh, kind of programming language. It's a, think of it as a kind of a paradigm that allows you uh, to prove wrong things, but uh, gives you a lot of power and freedom to think about, uh, you know, to, to, to come up with an algorithm uh, without getting bogged down in uh, a, a lot of detail. So, it's, uh, so you can come up with an algorithm while pretending it's an actual distribution. It's often much easier to think about this thing as an actual distribution, and 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 and, uh, and then um, you 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 use kind of you go back to your analysis of the algorithm and, and try and extract from it a proof. And often, what happens is that um, like this, it separates the, the work of designing a rounding algorithm into two parts. This part is the part that's uh, creative uh, when you come up with an algorithm given actual moments, but often uh, not technically compli complicated. So it kind of requires creativity, but not uh, you know, a lot of calculations and, and, and a lot of uh, bounds, etc. This part is not creative because it's kind of mechanically going on uh, the, your proof line by line and making sure that all your arguments uh, are uh, sum of squaresable, but uh, it often is kind of, the, it will be the long, maybe the longer part of the, proof of the paper and uh, take more uh, you know, technical effort. So it kind of separates nicely the, the, uh, this thing to two parts, which can be useful. And there is um, there's also this question of, when, when you're pretending this is actual distribution, there is something that's somewhat uh, deeply uh, troubling about that. And, and this is uh, that, you know, suppose we are talking about max cut. So, you know, we are given a graph G. And now we want to find a rounding algorithm for max cut. And that's what we'll do actually like next, next week. Uh, and we uh, basically, we pretend that we are given distribution uh, mu over um, cuts of g with value um, alpha. So, so we kind of pretend that we are given uh, a distribution over cuts of g. And generally, the way if you, uh, y y we are given the moments of this distribution. And generally, uh, you can try to compute things like, uh, you know, uh, you can try to compute like the marginals, for example. Uh, you can try to compute like, say, expectation over mu of xi, and maybe expectation over mu, uh, y y uh, things like uh, expectation uh, over, uh, of some higher moments. Uh, and, and generally, what you'll come to the con conclusion, or almost all cases, you'll come to, for, to the conclusion that this uh, distribution actually has kind of uh, a lot of entropy. Typically, the marginals will be half, like, you know, and, uh, and the correlations will also be kind of small between uh, two guys. So you kind of come to the conclusion that it, based on these moments, 
that uh, these marginals of um, there, there is kind of a, a lot of this distribution has a lot of support if it was an actual distribution. But this is somewhat confusing because maybe often you would think that in a graph, if you take the absolute maximum cut, there will be only one of them. Right, so, so it's kind of in some sense, uh, maybe there, there, there is a, you might even be promised, someone might tell you, you know, I generated this graph in a way that there is only a single unique maximum cut. But still you define this, uh, you take this pseudo distribution and, uh, and it will seem to tell you, hey, hey, I am giving you now a distribution, not just on one cut like that, on many of those cuts. So, so in some sense, like, uh, it's somewhat confusing. In some sense, maybe the graph doesn't even have a cut at all, but still you will find the pseudo distribution that pretends as if you have m many cuts. And, and, and this is basically uh, the, the way, uh, so it's some, it can be hard to kind of interpret. How, do, how can I pretend that this is an actual distribution if uh, I kind of have good reason to believe that there is not, no actual distribution over cuts of this graph that has this property? And this is kind of the other paradigm we kind of use, uh, which I kind of call uh, the Bayesian Kool-Aid. So what we do is we kind of think like Bayesians. Like, you know, if you think like a Bayesian, you might say the following thing. Yes, there is only one unique uh, cut, but because I, have, I don't know it, I have uncertainty about it. So this entropy is not really an entropy because there are many cuts. It's an entropy because I have a lot of uncertainty. So uh, it's somewhat confusing because typically Bayesians, you don't think about like uncertainty because you're bounded computationally. You think of uncertainty because you, know, you don't have enough information. But it's somewhat similar, right? Uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, if I look at uh, this is kind of example, I, you know, something I give, like say, suppose, you know, I personally, you know, don't know the eye colors of my great grandfather. So to me, uh, you know, he, he either had blue eyes or he didn't. The, you know, it already happened. There is no probability involved. But, uh, but to me, the, the event, whether he, he had blue eyes or not, uh, I can put a probability on it. Maybe based on maybe on all its uh, descendants, I can kind of put some probability of, uh, of whether he had blue eyes or not. So the, in some sense, it makes no sense because the, he either had them or didn't have them. It already happened. But uh, I, I don't have knowledge about it, so I can put probability on it. And you can think of these, uh, and, and you can think of, uh, uh, of these pseudo distributions, therefore, because they, they kind of typically will, will uh, show you more uncertainty than there should exist. That they, they, it's really the uncertainty about your knowledge. Uh, but this time, it's your knowledge because you're computationally bounded. It's not because there is not information. The graph is given to you in all you know, its glory, all the edges. If you just had exponential time at your disposal, you would be able to find the maximum cut. And the, you would have zero entropy about uh, you know, what this cut is. But because you don't have this amount of time, you, you have uncertainty. And the reason I kind of call this Bayesian Kool-Aid is because what you do is, which I think also Bayesians do, is you take these probabilities that in some sense don't, that don't make any sense and talk about uh, your uncertainty and then you pretend that they are actual probability distributions and you do whatever manipulation on them as if they were actual probability distributions. And you, know, you, you cross your fingers and you hope that uh, you know, uh, either you didn't make any mistake or at least if you made a mistake that the referees won't find out. <laughs> and... Um, and I think this is um, all I wanted to say for today. So any, any questions? So, so if there are not qu no questions, so let's again, uh, everyone please join Piazza. Um, right, so, so go to the website, so join Piazza. And um, I'll probably mail you some uh, reading homeworks um, on Monday. But uh, if you haven't yet read the reading, uh, so the reading that you, uh, if you haven't yet read the, the lecture notes for this, for today's lecture, 
Um, it's already there on the web page. Maybe I'll send a reminder. Uh, and on Monday, I'll give some more reading towards uh, Friday's lecture. And yeah, I hope, I hope to see you um, I hope to see you on Friday uh, in, at Harvard, Maxwell Dworking. Um, it's only like a $12 Uber away and you can share it with three people. <laughs> and, um, and it's, um, and, and, yeah, if you have any comments about the course, like uh, things that you would like me to cover, things that are confusing, uh, feel free to talk to me, email me, send a private message on Piazza, send an anonymous message, uh, post an anonymous message on Piazza, uh, public, non-anonymous, whatever, uh, whatever works.